was the family clinging to the, the porch. They started screaming to me, help us, can you help us, please help us. And uh, there was an old man standing on the bridge with me who was trying everything he could to get to them. And so I joined with him trying to get to the people. And, and um, it, was, it was about 14 feet deep on the street between us and the house. So there was no way to get to them that way. And so I begged them just to hold on, to stay there, because uh, help surely would be coming soon. So I reached for the camera, and the man standing with me, he looked at me and said, you're not taking a picture of this. And I said, oh, I, I have to. It's, it's, and I explained all the things that, that I just said, that, uh, you know, that we, we have to show what's going on here. And um, he said, I will, I will not let you shoot a picture. And so I, we, we began this ethical, moral journalism debate right here with the howling wind, and the, now the rain was starting back. And um, I said, I'm, I'm going to shoot a picture, but I'm, I'm only going to shoot a couple. And he says, how can you shoot a picture with people in such peril and distress? And I said, once again, people need to see it. And then I raised the camera up, and I shot three or four frames just very quickly. And... Um, in the picture, you can see the, the woman in the background with the ice chest is staring right at me. And I, I hate that in photographs, but she's staring a hole through me. I remember telling the man, I said, one day we'll sit down and have a cup of coffee over this, and I'll explain why this picture is so important. And I remember him saying, I will never have coffee with the likes of you. It was a surreal moment. It was it was unbelievable to look out the window at what looked like a lake. Uh, from, from our building on, as far as I could see, you could see that the interstate, which is, which is elevated, didn't have water on it, but everything else had water. So that's when it, it felt like the whole world was underwater. About mid-morning Tuesday, a group of editors met in my office and uh, we came to the conclusion unanimously that we could not stay any longer in this building. And at the same time, uh, as we were debating, our publisher was having the same thoughts and stuck his head in our door. And we all agreed that uh, the moment had come to leave. I talked to Brian Tevenot, uh, education reporter, and to David Meeks, the sports editor, and told both of them that I didn't want to go. And they both said the same thing. And David said he had had an idea of asking for a truck to come back into the city. Well, we no sooner had pulled up to set up, and a New Orleans police officer pulls it into the street and confronts me right away and says, who are you? and what are you doing here? And I told him who I was, and I said, we're setting up a news bureau in that house. And he looks at me and he says, are you armed? And I thought this was a guy out trying to get guns off the street. So I said, I think I'm getting out of trouble. And I say, oh, no, no, we're not armed, we're reporters. And he goes, oh, well, can you make yourself armed? And within a half an hour, an unmarked black SWAT car pulls into Ottoman Street there's three guys in complete body armor and helmets and masks, heavily armed, and they give us a 357 and a shotgun. So it was a hot day. Uh, it smelled like hell, of course, everywhere as it did, almost in the whole city. And there were people just, uh, you know, laid out in front of me, all all down the front of the convention center, which as you know is a huge building right next to the river. And there were people who were, um, you know, sort of losing control of their anger, understandably. There were people who were weeping. There were old men and women who said they didn't have their medicine. And, and you see those scenes and you see people suffering and they have nothing left. They don't even have a chair and there's no buses. And they've been there, sitting there for three straight days around the clock. And 
and I had on a Times Picune shirt, and people would yell out at you. They'd say, Times Picune, man, tell them the truth. Tell them what's going on down here. And I remember thinking, you know, this is a better country than that. We can do a hell of a lot better than that. There were, there were no police uh, anywhere in sight. There were no soldiers anywhere in sight. And this went on. This went on to the point for four or five days where we really started to get personally angry about it. I, I remember once, you know, looking up at the sky, literally, and saying, where the fuck are the feds? You know, where, where is the cavalry? Where are, you know, don't people realize what it's like here? We've been telling them for three or four days. And then in the, in the middle of all of that, this, this woman just starts singing, belting out gospel songs. And uh, I think it is one of the single most powerful things I have ever seen, one of the single most emotional uh, things I have ever seen. I had a, several bundles of newspapers brought down to me, maybe, I don't know, three to 500 papers. And I said, they said, what are you going to do with those? I said, I'm going to Convention Center Boulevard. And I will never forget the reception I got when I went down there. People have been sitting there for days. There's no TV. There's no phones. There's no information. They don't know anything. They know they've been sitting there and waiting. Suddenly there's a guy there with a Times Picune shirt on and a big stack of newspapers, and I got completely mobbed. We don't have anything for these people. We don't have water. We don't have food. We don't have escape. We have nothing to give them. You know, they're stranded on a bridge. They've just fought for their lives. They've just been plucked off their roofs or out of the second story windows. What became apparent to us as we talked to them was that the mere fact that the Times Picky and the local newspaper was there was of tremendous comfort to them. You know, when you're a journalist, you're always taught to keep an arm's length from everything. It doesn't calculate what happens when the worst natural disaster in the history of the United States hits your house, hits your family, hits the family of all your friends and the people you love. Once that happens, no matter who you are or no matter how objective you think you're going to be, you will never be the same. I've never been more emotionally involved with a story. I loved the news before, but this news affected me and everybody that I know and am close to my family, my friends. And I feel like I've, I'm, I've been part of something really, really important. And every day that we put out a good newspaper, I feel like I'm contributing to the rebuilding of New Orleans.